The national focus on acts of police brutality often overlooks victims who are Asian American and Pacific Islander. That's because data show that as a whole they experience low rates of fatal police violence, but new research shows the risks some in that community face are much higher. Allie Rogan starts this report in Antioch, California. It's part of our Race Matters series. And a warning, some images may be disturbing. This, uh, this is Angela's room. This is his altar. Cassandra Quinto Collins visits her late son Angelo's bedroom often to keep his memory alive. I turn the light on every night. I say good morning to him every morning. I, I don't know, I'm just very sentimental like that. Of course. <laughs> it's like I, I still feel like, you know, this is, he's here. Angelo's younger sister Bella remembers him <laughs> by watching old videos. He always wanted to entertain my friends and I. You know, he would just do cartwheels outside the house with us. Happy memories growing up in the Philippines and the U.S. But his family says the Navy veterans' 30 years were also shaped by mental health issues. He would have these infrequent episodes of, you know, um, fear and paranoia. During those episodes, he wanted us to be together to make sure that nothing happened to us. One evening in December 2020, Angelo became paranoid and tried to restrain his mother and sister, something they say he'd never done before. I really felt desperate for somebody to come and uh, help de-escalate and just calm him down because all of us were just really, really anxious. So Bella called 911. This is where it happened. He was laying here. Police handcuffed Angelo in Cassandra's bedroom then she says they turned him on his stomach and knelt on him. Within minutes, he was unresponsive. She filmed her son being carried out to paramedics. That's when I panicked. You know, that's when I started asking what's happening, what's going on, the he have a pulse, but nobody was answering me. He never regained consciousness and died three days later. Angelo Quinto is part of a largely overlooked group of victims of fatal police encounters in this country, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, or AAPIs. It's a hugely diverse community with dozens and dozens of countries of origin, uh, really different histories of colonization and immigration, and all of those things shape their exposure to the police and their interactions with the police. Gabriel Schwartz is an epidemiologist who studies public health and policing at the University of California, San Francisco. America's more than 25 million Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have roots in more than 30 countries. And as a whole, they experience the lowest rates of fatal police violence out of any racial group in the U.S. But Schwartz says that hides a disturbing reality. At sort of the regional level, Pacific Islanders are experiencing levels of police violence that are lethal, on par with Native Americans, on par with Black Americans. And though lower, Southeast Asian Americans whose countries of origin were affected by the U.S. war in Southeast Asia, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Lao, Hmong people, are all experiencing much higher levels than sort of other Southeast Asians even, or East or South Asians. Americans from Southeast Asia, like the Quinto family, and Pacific Islanders make up less than 40 percent of AAPIs in the U.S. Schwartz says their outsized risks are hidden when combined with other Asian Americans. He believes the unique histories of both small communities may play a role in the higher rates of fatal police violence they experience. When my parents and my sisters boarded that plane to come to the United States in 1979, it was the first time they've ever taken a flight. Vinnie Eng's family moved to Los Angeles after surviving three years in a labor camp run by Cambodia's brutal Khmer Rouge regime. The Engs were part of the biggest resettlement of refugees in U.S. history. Starting in 1975, more than one million people fleeing U.S.-involved conflicts in Southeast Asia moved to America. For the 30 years following their arrival to Los Angeles, they were learning something new every day. There was no long-term support for this wave of Southeast Asian refugees when they arrived in the U.S., and many struggled to get out of poverty. 
Researcher Gabriel Schwartz says that legacy may increase the likelihood of potentially fatal police interactions. Because that then makes communities have higher rates of poverty, higher rates of discrimination in education in the workforce. People are poor, people are living in neighborhoods that are more over-policed, and that puts them in the path of the criminal legal system. Schwartz says that America's Pacific Islander communities also face those acute outcomes in part because of their history. Many Pacific Islanders are here because of U.S. colonization that has made um, the economies of the Pacific Islands much more reliant on the United States, uh, have fewer opportunities than they otherwise might have. Gaynor Tanga is a Samoan Latina community advocate in San Francisco. So Pacific Islanders here in this city have the highest of disparities in everything. She says police killings were a fact of life growing up. I've seen it firsthand. You know, I had um, four folks that are very close to me, family, um, all shot and killed by police. Several of her family members were incarcerated, and she joined a gang when she was 11 after being sexually assaulted. It was a group of folks that were way older than me that I finally was able to share this secret with. Like, as a kid, you don't know what's wrong or right. Gang life led to repeated violence, she says. First time I was shot was 13. And run-ins with law enforcement. <laughs> they even had my picture on the dashboard, you know, and I'm just a kid. It's a cycle Siatanga is now trying to stop. You know, we have everything you can want here, the one-stop shop. Today, she heads the hut, a new space dedicated to addressing the stark disparities in her community. Here, Pacific Islanders can access or be referred to tailored services from a Pacific language library to immigration assistance to career training. There's some things that causes the behaviors or, or the life that many of us are living right now, and that's what I'm addressing. On top of economic support, Schwartz says targeted mental health services are also needed. People are dealing with mental health crises with fewer mental health resources. All of those things make it more likely they're going to be interacting with the police. Vinny Eng experienced that firsthand. His sister Jasmine was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and psychodisassociative disorder, he says, partly caused by her childhood experience of working in a labor camp. That trauma of the experience of surviving such unspeakable experiences left unresolved can lead to potentially violent outcomes. In 2012, at age 40, Jasmine was shot and killed by L.A. Sheriff's deputies after she had an episode of paranoia at her community clinic. It was just an incredible amount of force applied at a situation when what really was needed was for someone to provide care. One thing that I'm still working on is the website. Back in Antioch, Angelo Quinto's family has spent the last two and a half years advocating for reform. In 2021, they helped pass a new state law banning police restraints which impair breathing. You know, he's not here to tell his story. So the advocacy we're doing right now is to prevent other families go through what we are going through and what we went through. So hopefully his story helps. And earlier this month, the city of Antioch launched a new crisis response team that 911 dispatchers can send to respond to low-level mental health crises and disputes. The team is named after Angelo. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Allie Rogan in Antioch, California.